Hello, this is Lowell Thompson with Learning with Lowell, a podcast that covers healthcare, biotech, anything science related really, or anything that really fascinates me. I'm open to input on that. Any suggestions, advice, send them my way. Go to learningwithlowell.com and subscribe today. Hello, today we have Elizabeth and she is a policy manager. She has gone from, let me just give you a little snippet. She has worked in Congress. She has worked with the USDA. She has worked in the White House. She has a PhD fascinating person this is a two-parter so stay tuned to the second part which will be coming right after this thank you can you describe Mm -hmm. your background and uh some of the like noteworthy things that you have done to this point sure sure i uh I grew up in suburban New Jersey. Uh, I was not connected to agriculture or food at all, except for like a home economics class here and there, which by the way, I loved. I loved to cook even as a, as a kid. I loved to eat even more. Um, I went to college at Brown University. I majored in biology, which was you know one of those things where I kind of knew I wanted to go into biology. I really liked it, but I was totally open to something else, if something better came along, but it didn't. I just loved what I was doing. So um, I uh, got I got my degree in biology and German studies. I, I did uh, a year after graduating at the University of Delaware, where I worked as a, an assistant at a, in a plant breeding and molecular plant pathology lab, which was really interesting and a lot of fun. And I really enjoyed being outside uh, for about half that year. And then I got into a graduate program, a molecular biology graduate program at Yale University and got my PhD there. After that, I've been bouncing around in Washington, D.C., uh, fellowship after fellowship, trying to <laughs> get myself health care. Um, it was uh, I did a fellowship through the, the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, funded by the American Micro, uh, the, I'm sorry, the American Society for Microbiology. And uh, that put me in Congress for a year as a staffer. And that was just super cool, really amazing opportunity for anyone, <clears throat> excuse me, who has a PhD. It's just awesome. And then uh, I got another fellowship directly after that working in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, which was just as amazing as it sounds. Um, and then after that, I, I worked for the USDA for... Um, for a little over a year in their office of the chief scientist before I landed this permanent job that I'm that I have now where I work as a science policy manager for an alliance of three scientific societies uh, the American Society of Agronomy and the Crop and Soil Science Societies of America that's, uh, that's where I am now <laughs> that is that is a uh, like some pedigree like that <laughs> white house <laughs> uh, plant breeding uh, congress you know like that is that is a very eventful <laughs> background it was there was that moment where I was walking. You know, we lived in Washington D.C. My husband and I. We walked past the White House while I was working in Congress. I was like, "Wow, it'd be great to cool." It was how cool would it be to work at the White House? And my husband's like, "Yeah, uh huh, okay." And then the next year, I made it happen, and <laughs> it was it was a little beyond reality. Uh, I'll tell you. Are there any any things that you did specifically to get? Um, into the White House, like I, I can't imagine the process. I imagine they have like a really extensive like background um, background check and stuff. Yes, they do. So actually, that was that was a you know it's one of those stories. If you ask anyone, I think if you ask anyone who's done kind of randomly amazing things, how on earth did you land that job or did you get? The, and they'll say, well, it was this series of crazy coincidences, which is true. I mean, you can't plan on doing, um, like as much as my story seemed to imply that, you can't plan on doing just randomly doing amazing, interesting things. But you can, I don't know, you set yourself up as best as you can. So um, when I was in a PhD program, um, my advisor, my PhD advisor, her name is, uh, her name was Joe Handelsman, and she was a professor at Yale. And um, she also happened to be the president of the American Society for Microbiology. So I applied to a couple of different AAAS fellowships through these different societies. And that was the one that offered me the fellowship. Coincidence? I don't know. (laughs) 
And then the same, um, I think it was the same week that I heard from that society that I won the fellowship. Uh, my boss, Joe, took me into her office and she said, I have, I have a secret. You can't tell anyone. She had been tapped to go to the White House and work in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So she was there already while I was working in Congress. And, you know, we had lunch and we met up and she said, oh, this is a great office. You got to figure out a way to get here. And it's not like I would have even thought that that was a possibility if I hadn't had her, you know, that contact and her working there. And so um, it was actually my own uh, home scientific society for my research was the um, American uh, Phytopathological Society. I know it's a, a mouthful, the plant doctors, the plant doctor people. Um they're wonderful, and they they have a fellowship that puts people into uh, the executive branch, so like the White House, for example. And it just so happens that that year they had decided to fund that fellowship, and uh, and so I had the heads up that they were going to fund it. So even though I wasn't able to make it to their annual meeting, I I watched the the like simulcast, saw got all the information about this fellowship, and and you know, and applied. So, you know, I had the skills that they were looking for at the exact right time that they were looking for them. And uh, so, you know, sometimes, sometimes things work out if you know where to look. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's, it's been consistent with a, a lot of the people I've interviewed so far in that, like, where, how they got into it. It's like, it's not like they did everything that, like, you would think they would have to do. Like, I think that's like a, a kind of like a really interesting insight so far. And that, like, if you, if it's really just like setting yourself up for success, like you said, like open as many, like just try to set yourself up so you can have as many doors open as possible. And then it's kind of like, oh, which one fits better for me? And also, and I know, you know, you wanted to talk about this later too. Also, there's this, there's this feeling, I think, uh, among a lot of people, especially among women I've met. Um, that if they don't have every single requirement or job specification, that it's not even worth applying. And that's just not true. You know, if you think it looks cool and you think you would be really good at that job or you think you would be, you know, decent at that job, but you really, really want it, that want goes so far. I think it can eclipse, you know, the fact that you don't have X, Y, Z experience um, because people want to work with people who want to be there. And they would rather, in my experience, they'd rather take someone who maybe doesn't have every single piece of experience or knowledge that they want, but who is, you know, eager to learn and really loves the material and wants the job. Mm -hmm. And especially in, in today's world where you have the internet, so if you're yeah. deficient in anything, you can you can find guides, you can find people who do know this stuff and, and try and tap them for advice. Like, I think Absolutely. It's, like we live, we live in the time of self improvement. Like I, I think it's like, I think the a lot of problems I, I've noticed is that like sometimes people get stuck trying to figure out what they should be doing that they don't do things that they can be doing to like set themselves right. up. And it's like, but do what do what you can. Like there's a That's right. there's a guy, Victor E. Frankel's uh, Man's Search for Meaning, where he said that in be like he was he basically he's a guy who who's a psychiatrist that survived uh, Auschwitz. And he said that, like, the thing that kept me going through the day is, like, whenever you're, fo like, very extreme. <laughs> this is definitely an extreme. But whenever you're uh, facing with, with a, you know, stuff happening, like, focus on what you can do versus on, like, all these other things. Because, like, like, then you'll get, like, sad and, you know, depressed and you won't be able to do anything. So, like, that's, that's one of the things I always try and, like, point out to people. It's, like, just focus on what you can do. And then, like, yeah, you'll go places. You know, that's, that's such an interesting thing to say, especially in government right now, where your options are so limited because of the budget, because of the politics, because of everything. Um, when I was in graduate school, I got really interested in this idea of science policy, and I wanted to find out as much as I could about it. And one of the things I did was I, I joined a group of other students who were also interested in this idea of science policy. We didn't really know much about it, but we, we decided to learn more. And one of the things that I did was I went on a, a field trip and then later organized a second field trip down to D.C. to talk to people who were actually doing science policy. And, and you know, we had I had a great time. The more people I talked to, you know, the more I thought this 
this is it. This is exactly what I want to do with the rest of my life. I love this. This is so interesting. It uses, you know, all the skills that I want to be using. And we came back after this field trip. Um, we had like a pizza party and a debrief with all the all the members of the club who who and any other students and postdocs who were interested but who couldn't make it. And we sat down to talk about what had happened. And there was this one woman. I remember she just had not had such a great time. And we had gone, we had organized this panel uh, with uh, people at, at AAAS, at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They were telling us about the fellowship that they sponsor, but also just, you know, how the government works and how that society interacts with public policy. And, and this one woman had just been really upset that they weren't doing more. And so we had this debrief pizza party. She, she said, you know, this was awful. They're not doing anything there in Washington. They're just sitting on their hands. They're not getting anything done. Everything takes so long. She was angry about it. And I thought, you know, gosh, if you're in a PhD program, okay, you're, you're doing research. If you, over the course of six or seven years, produce one really good piece of, of knowledge and publish it, you are doing great. Like, good on you. You get a PhD award. Ding, ding, ding. You know, you win. (laughs) And, and it takes forever. And and if you're, you know, a senator and in your first six year term, you produce one piece of legislation that actually passes. Oh my goodness. Ding, 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 ding. (laughs) You win. That's amazing. That's just the time scale that this stuff happens on. And, you know, most senators, don't. They don't. The junior senators don't produce a, a piece of legislation in their first term. It, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to to change the system. And if, if you kind of know that you're working in that framework and you say, okay, maybe I'm not going to get this piece of legislation passed, but here are the things that I can do. You know, I can, I can look at oversight of the executive branch. I can look at, you know, different ways we can tweak language of existing bills. You know, there are all these kinds of options of other things that can be done that can, can help in whatever way you, you know, you want. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a question that kind of popped to my mind while you were, were talking about this is, like, you went on, like, this, you know, basically self-exploration type, like, field trip. To, uh, I don't know a, a good way to describe it, but... Yeah, I was just thinking, what like you talked about, like how it like really like hit all your buttons for like things that really fascinated you. I was, so what what does what is science policy and what about it like really enthralled you? Yeah, what is science policy? Um, so there are two kind of different pieces of science policy. One piece is what we call policy for science. So this is any anything that. And it can be like a budget for scientific research or regulations on your research, anything that impacts how research is done. So, for example, um, you might have a moratorium on stem cell research, right? You're not allowed to use human embryonic stem cells, for example. That could be uh, a regulation or a law that's passed that can really impact um, how science is done. Or, or, you know, you're dealing with a very dangerous agricultural or human pathogen, a really dangerous microorganism that if it escaped could be really uh, detrimental to health or the economy or, or something. And so we're going to put regulations on how you have to register that you're using it, log how much you're using, where you're using it, you know, those types of, th- those types of regulations all the way down to or up to the budget that you have to do any kind of research. That's all policy for science. Okay, so that's one big half of it. And the other half is the science for policy. In other words, you may have a... you may have a, a problem, you know, like there's a, an Ebola outbreak in Africa, and suddenly we need, you know, the government needs a bunch of information about, you know, what we should be doing, what science says is the best way to tackle this. You can have, you know, one group of people saying, all right, we really need to get the epidemiological resources out there. We need to be doing X, Y, Z in terms of prevention and preventing things from spreading. But then you also might have a bunch of scientists who are working on the equipment that first responders need, um, how to, you know, how to facilitate lightweight, you know, 
outfits, like those biohazard outfits that aren't so hot because you are having people in Africa, uh, in Western Africa, trying to to work with people and to not scare them <laughs> wearing these crazy hot pieces of equipment that you had to like just change out of every couple of hours, even if you're doing something important because you would literally have heat exhaustion otherwise. So there's all this kind of science behind um behind policy that uh, that we you know scientists don't often think of when uh, when they first think about it so in terms of what pushed my buttons I I I felt very confined when I was doing my own PhD research I got that what I was doing could have big Im- impacts on the world you know in many, many years, someday it might help somebody. And, you know, I liked that it was contributing to knowledge overall. But the idea of of working on just one thing for so long, really, it, I'm not going to say it was boring, but I'm going to say that it wasn't as stimulating as I wanted it to be. And the idea of working in an office where I would be like actually in touch every day with a variety of really important issues where, you know, I could make a difference in any one of them at any moment. Um, that was, that was what was really exciting to me. A uh, question on, um, like a policy in general, like when you, when you put out a, like, you know, the, the Ebola policy, how quickly are you able to see like the effects of it? And like, how does, how do you like, how does like that process work? Like policy gets set up, and then, you know, like it's put into practice and then maybe, maybe it needs tweaking or like you can kind of like see like a feedback and then you like update it. Like, is that like tends to be how it works or, or is it more like you put so much energy into like making the policy more or less correct that when it goes in there, there's, there's usually not corrections that need to be made. Like, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, but it really depends. I mean, some types of policy can be put into place right away. Like an exec- like if you're working at the White House and the president issues an executive order, it can happen right away. If the executive order is to form a committee to then research something to do, you know, then, then it could take a little bit longer. But if, if, you know, if you're working on some kind of policy in the, I don't know, the president issues an executive order that says, um, you know, that we're going to invest X dollars in, I don't know, the, the, the brain initiative or the human microbiome project, then those, you know, you can just, it gets started right away. So it, it depends where you are. Some things definitely take a lot of time. Normally, how it works is Congress passes a law, and then it's up to the agencies to interpret that. Sometimes Congress is not so clear about how exactly they want it to be um, done. So, for example, Congress uh, passed a food labeling law for uh, genetically modified organisms, for example. And they said, okay, USDA, you've got to figure out how to create this label, implement it, and, uh, and regulate it. And that's a really big task. So, I mean, the first thing USDA has to do is figure out what they think is the letter of the law, what they should be doing. They send it out for public comment. They get a bunch of comments back. Comments go in all different directions from, you know, we shouldn't be labeling these things at all. It's not scientific to we shouldn't be eating these things at all. They should never even be put into the ground. And so they have to kind of glean from that some advice and then maybe tweak their idea or reissue something or ask for more comments or, or maybe they have a great idea or what they think is a great idea and they they want to socialize it around the country so they might have listening sessions around the country i mean it it can drag out <laughs> for quite some time before they finally you know issue a regulation saying okay this is how it's going to be done food companies listen up this is uh this is what the label needs to look like it can take years that's just kind of like a, a fascinating thing to think about that like that's kind of like how it works how does I can't think of the question. It's like it's just uh, it's it's utterly fascinating, honestly, to to learn more about how this process works because it's it's especially when it comes to food and agriculture. Like if 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 that is not done right, you get the dust bowl. You know, like a, a, like yeah. a macro scale. If that that is not done yeah. right, you get lead in your in your food. Like it's just like it's such an utterly important thing. And I think we as as the as a country, I think we do such a great job that most people do not think about it. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. Mm-hmm. Which is like a like a double edged sword, you know. It's like you're you're doing such a good job that people kind of forget why it's so important, you know. Which well, 
Well, yes and no. You know, it's it's interesting. We do a great job uh, on some things and not on others. So, so for example, if if agriculture research is chugging along, you know, we've got a lot of different ways that agriculture is research in this country from from the USDA itself that does its own intramural research across the country to grants that it gives to universities and colleges to do their own research, to foundations that, you know, do their own research. There's a lot of ways to do it, right? Um, Now, animal research is one of those things that has been kind of leveled off for a long time that there hasn't, well, actually any agriculture research has not had a, a boost in over 10 years. In, and in, with inflation, it's been getting a lot lower every year. So, you know, agriculture research funding is one of my uh, topics that I always like to harp on because I don't think people understand that, you know, as as the money goes away, people are just trying to scrape by. So last year we had this outbreak of highly pathogenic avian influenza. We killed 50 million birds in this country, more than that actually. And at the height of this outbreak, we didn't even know how the disease was being transmitted from bird to bird, which is like, that's ridiculous. You know, we were not out on top of this. And and people, you know, for like like one hot minute, we're like, oh, chicken's kind of pricey right now. And that's it. And, you know, the, the same thing happened, like if you're, if you're living in, I don't know, Connecticut, there was a, there was an outbreak of, um, of this, it's, a, it, it's the same thing that caused the Irish potato famine. If you've heard of that, it, it can also um, contaminate uh, tomatoes. So there was an outbreak on tomatoes uh, in the Northeast um, oh, about five or six years ago. And you know, farms were like farmers went out of business. Okay. And if you just went to the grocery store, you'd be like, oh, I guess tomatoes are a couple cents more because instead of getting them locally, you get them from California or Mexico or South America or somewhere else. And like the global supply chain is such that it can buffer those, you know, regional issues, which is great which is amazing, <laughs> which is like the first time in the history of the world that that we can do that. And that's that's fundamentally incredible and prevents us from having a famine, you know, which we've never experienced in this country with the possible exception of the Dust Bowl, but it wasn't really a famine. We were producing enough food. And yet, and yet there are those farmers that went out of business. And the more farmers in America that go out of business because of the lack of research or other issues, um, regulatory, financial, whatever, uh, land, there's, there's a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of reasons farmers could go out of business. Um, what ends up happening is that grocery stores just find someone else to send that product in. And maybe it's not coming from this country. Maybe it's coming from a different country. And, and so, you know, as a consumer you know, even if you're paying a little bit more, sometimes you're paying a little bit less because uh, the regulations in those other countries aren't as great, or maybe they're not paying their farmers or farm workers as much. So, you know, as a, as a, as a consumer, you may not even know or care whether that was produced nearby or even in the country or not. But I'll tell you what, if there ever is a real problem with our food supply, um, you know, either because of climate change or like a deliberate terrorist attack or, or just, you know, a random reason, uh, pathogen or, or anything. Um, other countries, this has happened to, they, they close their borders. They say, okay, no rice is coming out of our country until we make sure our people are fed. And if that starts to happen, and countries start closing their borders because they have to feed their people, then, you know, where are we going to get our food from if we've drummed all our farmers out of business? So these regulations, it's it's insanely important that we get it right and that we keep our farmers in business. What what are some things that, this will kind of hit a twofer on our, on our list of topics, um, mm-hmm. federal research spending and, uh, what was the other one, uh, ag literacy, and I think probably the farm bill will probably be like hooked up in this question. What are some, <laughs> <laughs> what are, what are some things that people should know so they can be better informed and make an impact like what a better way of asking the question is like what can what can someone like me or someone listening do to like help out and then what are some things that they really should be paying attention as they go about their day because i think one of the most effective ways that people can vote is with their dollar so if, if there's any like heuristic they can go through 
at, while they're like buying something, for instance, that could be really helpful. So as like a macro question. So this is this is actually a much more difficult question than I want to admit. <laughs> um, and and the reason is like let's say that you buy organic food because you think that it's better for the environment. That um, that organic means no pesticides, no herbicides, you know, that, that it's more sustainable. The problem is there's really nowhere you can go, like on a USDA website, to get a definition for a consumer of what organic means. The USDA has a, a bunch of information for farmers to tell them how they can get an organic and keep an organic certification, but it's not like non-farmer friendly language at all. And so, you know, when I, I you know, I, I did not come of age in, in an agricultural setting. I grew up in suburban New Jersey. I did not go to an ag school by any stretch of the imagination. I took like plant courses, but it was like molecular plant courses, really, you know, not nothing to do with food production per se. But I, I was interested. So I just kind of learned before there was a lot of you know, before organic was a thing, before there was a lot of propaganda about it, I just, you know, kind of took it on myself to learn this stuff. And now there is so much crazy misinformation out there that it, it 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 shouldn't shock me, but it does shock me when I see people get it wrong. It shouldn't it, it shouldn't shock me because there is so much kind of weird information out there. People say, oh, you know, organic means no pesticides. And I thought, you know, what? That's not what it means. That's not it at all. You're totally allowed to use pesticides and herbicides in organic agriculture. You know, how else do you get rid of the pests? <laughs> you know, the, a field where you're growing like one crop is not a natural system. Like that's, you have to keep it in line somehow. So, you know, it's, it's, I, I'd love to be able to say to you, just, you know, buy this one type of food and you'll be, you know, it's the best thing to do for the environment. It's the best thing, but it's, it's so much more crazy complicated than that. So here, here's an example. Um, organic agriculture, you're not allowed to use, um, for the most part, not allowed to use synthetic chemicals. What does that mean? Uh, natural ones exist in the environment. Synthetic ones, you make in a lab. Um, I, synthet synthetic ones tend to last a little bit longer out there. Uh, on the one hand, that means they persist in the environment, which might not be so good depending on the chemical. On the other hand, it means you don't have to spray as often. So if you're a farm worker, it's actually a lot better for you not to have to spray so much. If you live near a farm, it's also better for you to have fewer applications. Um, so that's complicated. Uh, also, you know, if you're if you're in like Michigan, say, and you're growing apples, there are really dangerous to the apple bacteria that can infect your orchard. And there is no cure for this. Once you're infected, th those trees are basically dead. They can't produce any more fruit. They'll continue to live, but every year you'll get basically no crop. So what you have to do, like the only treatment there is, is to spray with antibiotics at the specific time of, of, of year, right when like the flower buds are coming out, you know, before there's a rain, cause you don't want the water to wash it away. Like, and, and so they've developed these incredibly sophisticated models that incorporate all kinds of data so that you spray at exactly the right time. So you won't get any runoff. They've done loads of tests to show that this kind of use probably, and of course I'm a scientist, so I'm going to say probably, cause you can never say definitively about anything, uh, probably doesn't persist in the environment very long. So this is like the most sustainable way to grow apples in Michigan is to use these models and to and to use the antibiotic because if you don't you're ripping up your orchards and trying again or you're planting something else and that's not by definition not sustainable. So so but that's not organic because you're using antibiotics, you know? So, so it, it's, it's really complicated. You know, if you're living in Michigan, do you buy the organic apples that are shipped from somewhere else using all those, you know, greenhouse gases to get to where you are? Or do you buy the local ones that you needed to use antibiotics for? It's, it's such a complicated question. Um, and there's no, there's just, there's just no good answer short of, I don't know, having like, down to the second, down to the region information about all of your crops on the label, um, which we, we don't have and people would probably not read anyway. 
probably take a, a, a lot of paper as well. So having like this nice confined label, you'd have like... Oh my gosh. Well, you know, one of the things that USDA wants to do for labeling, and actually the, the, the former Secretary of Agriculture, um, uh, Secretary Vilsack, he wanted to have just a QR code. You know, you just bring your smartphone into your grocery store, you know, snap a picture of that QR code and it would tell you all that information, what antibiotics you used, how far away it was produced, what pesticides, you know, what that the toxicity level of those pesticides are, what the residues are, you know, it would tell you all the information, but gosh, you'd have to have like a PhD to, to differentiate it, right? Like that's, that's, it's a crazy amount of information for every single thing you buy in the grocery store. I mean, what are you supposed to do with that information? I imagine like Amazon would probably make like a filtering system where you can be like, this is the type of food that I want to have. And then they would like use all that QR code to like filter it and only give you those selections. Cause they're like, they're going pretty crazy on their online shopping thing. I, I, I responded by saying, I think Amazon would probably just make like, uh, like they, they would take all that data and then as an example, cause like Amazon's doing great. It's probably cause I said Amazon, like Skype's like, don't, yeah. mention, don't mention anyone else on my platform. <laughs> <laughs> but uh for anyone listening we had like a desync but um and then like you can they would be like oh all this information we can make them get you the exact the exact produce that you want i imagine it'd be like a great business opportunity well so here's the thing i've been hearing from a variety of people that you know that and and, and normal people like not just like analysts and policy people, but, you know, normal people that they're kind of getting sick of all of the the labels. You know, you, you hear cage free, for example, is like the newest, hottest thing. But, you know, I, I'm kind of like, like, like I work in plants. I don't work on, on eggs or chickens, but I find this actually really interesting. Um, did you know that like 50 years ago, I guess it was like the 1940s, 50s, when they first developed cages for chickens, it was like, the best thing. They advertised it on the packages, on the egg cartons. Like our chickens have cages. It was, it was a huge big deal because the chickens were better off in cages. They were not pecking each other to death. They were, you know, and of course this is all a product of having a huge number of chickens all in one place. But even any backyard chicken person will tell you, yeah, chickens, they, they hurt each other. <laughs> like they're not friendly all the time. So, you know, but if you, the more chickens you have in one place, the more likely they are going to really hurt each other. And so, and not only that, but if you have a big place right now, one of the things that chicken uh, producers are dealing with is it's called keel bone fracture. Just imagine like falling because you're a chicken, not like a hawk or something and you break your sternum. And it, it's, it's painful and it's, it's like, you can't, you can't sell those birds either. So like the producers, even if they don't care, even if they don't care about the well being of the chickens, like they don't want that to happen anyway. So like there's money now, like research dollars going into how to prevent that. And, but people are demanding cage free eggs and cage free, you know, chickens out of proportion to what we actually, like the, the research that we actually have to figure out how to do it safely for the chickens. And, um, and if you think back like 50 to 60 or so years ago, when, you know, when cages were just starting to be introduced, like they were introduced for a reason. And, and I'm not, I'll be the last person to argue that it's like humane to put a chicken in a tiny cage where it can't like turn around or open up its wings. Okay. I'm, I'm the last person to say that, but at the same time, I, you know, I haven't been convinced by any evidence, any actual evidence that the chickens are happier without the cages, you know, they need like stimulation and, and the ability to turn around, but also the ability to not get pecked to death by their cage mates or their, you know, housemates and not fall down and break themselves. So there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff to it. So you see these labels and then you think, oh, it's great cage free. I love it. I love it. And then you hear this other information like, well, actually, you know, what about the well-being of the chickens? And you think, well, you know, <laughs> I'm just trying as a consumer to be well-informed and to do the right thing. And for, you know, for myself, for my health, for the environment and for the, the well-being of the animals. And, you know, I literally know people who say, forget it. I'm going vegetarian because they cannot deal with with the labels. And so there's some groups that want to create some sort of big label that everything could be under that says, you know, basically the don't feel built guilty at all, but if you buy something with this label on it label, 
And then others who say, well, that should have been organic <laughs> in the first place, but it's not. And and then you have companies like like Whole Foods, which, yeah, it's it's uh, it's expensive, right? I, I know it. I got one down the street and it's, it's really expensive. But what they're trying to do is saying, OK, if you come into the store, you do not have to have that responsibility. We will make all these decisions for you. We assure you that our products, if you buy it in our store, it is responsible to the environment. It is the fewest pesticides or herbicides possible. Not necessarily, you know, because uh, remember, organic doesn't necessarily mean no pesticides or herbicides, but but you know, the fewest is possible and the the best treatment for the farm workers, for the suppliers, for, you know, all of this stuff. And, you know, that kind of vetting, that is expensive to do. Like it's, it's hard to just assure yourself and, and then to buy things at scale that are all, you know, what your consumer thinks they're buying when they buy something like organic. And, and uh, Whole Foods was just bought by, it's just like a little, uh, I don't know, a little, little uh, snippet there. Um, Whole Foods mm. was just bought by Amazon, I think. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, will Amazon, you know, people think, well, does that mean that it's going to be more widespread? You know, will it get to more people? It, you know, remains to be seen. I, I love the idea of being able to walk into a store and not have to, I mean, this is like literally my job <laughs> to think about this stuff. And I still love the idea of not having to think about it when I'm doing my grocery sh shopping, not having to look at every single label to scan a QR code to, to get all the information. I would love that information to be there. Just saying. You know, if I have to make like a game time decision, but I want to go into a store and know that the fish that I buy was not harvested through slave labor. I want to go into a store and know that if those tomatoes are local, you know, they're, they're, they were grown, you know, by the farmer who is practicing all of the, you know, soil health um, and regenerative agriculture practices that they could be like there's, and yet I don't want to have to actually double check it. Nobody does. Nobody wants to have to do that. It's a, it's a huge pain for every single thing that goes into your grocery cart. Is there is there anything that, like any rule of thumbs for people to keep an eye out for, to stay away from? Like if, if instead of trying to find like the optimal things, it's like, it's probably not, I probably the same answer, but is there any way to like notice, or, or is there anything to notice the, like the worst things? Like instead of the top 10%, is there any way to notice the bottom 10%? Because then you can steer away from that. Then you're at least doing better. So, you know, it, it's funny to say that. Um, oof. I, 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 you know, there, there are a couple of things that people think about when they buy food, right? You're thinking about your own health first, like, and, and we're talking about people who are scared of, of pesticides or, you know, like additives, food colorings, um, and then there's just food safety. You know, you don't want to buy something that's gone bad, like that's past their expiration date or something, right? So, you, you know, there's the your health aspect of this. There's the environmental health aspect of this. If you're buying meat, you're thinking about the animal welfare aspect. Um, if you're buying something that was, uh, grown in another country, you might think about the farm workers themselves. Then again, the farm workers in this country, you might want to be thinking about it too. Um, people are probably not, but maybe should be thinking about the low paid workers who actually work in the meat processing plants or, you know, there, there are a lot of different things that you might be thinking about. And, and, and it's, I would say it's really, really hard to know uh, if if you have your own personal idea of what you care about most, um, it's really hard to buy stuff uh, that is is going to meet all of your specifications um, it, because it's hard to know what each individual product uh, how it was produced. Um, the thing that I'm going to stress is that it's really easy for anyone to say, "But don't buy this. Just don't buy this." This one's the worst. You know, there's that that list of the the dirty dozen, I think, that, you know, like these these uh, vegetables have the most pesticides on them or something like that. It's just the fact is that it is vegetables and fruits in this country are incredibly good for you. Like they're 
<laughs> the the amount of pesticides on them are just infinitesimally small. We don't there's not a lot of ag research that's that's been done on, you know, like some of the uh, you know, the stuff that I was talking about earlier, like, you know, avian influenza and, you know, best crop rotational practices for sustainability, et cetera. But man, do we test for pesticide residues? We do. And and the amount that you would have to eat to actually hurt yourself is so incredibly small. So if you're if you're shopping for your health, what I'm going to say is buy fruits and vegetables. You know, just just do it. Eat exactly the way that you know you should be eating in the first place. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's not the farm practices are not going to be the most important thing. And is in my opinion, buying locally is going to be way better for the environment than shipping stuff from across the world. And it's better for the local farmers because it helps them stay in business. So like, it, it's really hard for me to pick out stuff that I think you shouldn't eat. I mean, with the exception of the stuff that you know you shouldn't eat <laughs> for your health anyway. And uh, the, the the third tertiary thing to buying local would be that the, the tax dollars go back to your, you know, your school system and the, your local like community, even, even like, one step removed from the farmers, like it keeps them in the community. I think there was like a a study I read a while ago, like like putting like buying like at a, at a local place, like adds like several thousand dollars to like your school board or something like that. Like it's it's it's, it's kind of cumulative. Like it doesn't actually take that much, sort of. There's there's another aspect. I, I don't know. Most people don't know much about land grant institutions, um, but uh, okay. So land grants were founded. Um, by uh, Abraham Lincoln, actually, like during and shortly after the Civil War, so the 1860s. Um, the idea was that the federal government gave a bunch of land to states and said, you can do whatever you want with this land, but you have to set up uh, a university or college to teach the local people in your state uh, about agriculture and technology. And that's why a lot of them are actually called like A&T, like Texas A&T or, or uh, North Carolina, you know, or whatever. So, um, or, or A&M sometimes, same kind of thing. So, uh, so you have these, these states who then, some of them sold a lot of the land and brought up some, got the revenue from the sale of the land to make these uh, universities. And, and it worked for a little while. And then they realized that they'd run out of money. Uh, they, they built the universities. They, they hired the faculty. They had all the facilities. They started enrolling students. But they didn't quite have enough money to keep, keep it going the way that they wanted to. So they went back to the government and said, look, we've been training these people who then go back out into the community and grow food. And you tax them on their income, the income that we helped facilitate. So don't you think it would be fair? if some of that tax money came back to support the universities too. And so uh, the federal government said, yeah, okay, we could do that. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is where it, they're called formula funds or capacity funds. So some of, they use a formula to figure out, you know, what, what the, that state, um, what the farmers sort of made, basically, what their income was. And they send some of that money, the tax revenue, back to those land grants. So actually buying local also supports your own local land grant university, too. That's, that's, that's really fascinating. I didn't know we had, like, a, like a, a kickback like that at, at all. I, yeah. I, I thought it was just kind of, like, blocks. <laughs> Look, I, I'm not really big on taxes. I don't know how to do them. Uh, that's why I always <laughs> give someone else. I give it to someone else. I, I, I call it my I don't want to go to jail money like i just like here you go charge me whatever you need to do to like get me out to stay away from jail like make sure it's all legal i don't care if i pay more yeah because <laughs> I, I i mean this this is pretty like we're getting into the weeds here i of like like federal tax policy and agriculture research funding it's you know it's it's, it's uh i could i could go on and on but it's it's important you know and that particular money uh it's very interesting most most research dollars that comes out of the federal government go to what are called competitive programs. So like you're at a university and you've got this really cool idea. You look at like the National Science Foundation or even the USDA or, or, or something and you say, you know, hey, here's a proposal. This is how much money I want. What do you think? And the government actually gets a bunch of uh, your peers, basically, your other colleagues to, to rank these proposals, you know, is this any good? What do you think about this? And they will give, they will award money to the best ones. Um, 
in ag research, unfortunately, not even 50% of the ones that are considered excellent get funded. There's just not even enough money to to do that. So, so much research is just being left on the table. So much really good, possible, awesome research is being left on the table. But that idea of kind of a competitive system is really important because you get really new, innovative, awesome ideas that come out of it. But the flip side is that the more money we put into that, um, you know, people don't pay as much attention to the the formula funds or or um, even USDA's own in-house research. And, and so what good is that? They're not competitive grants because it's really not that interesting research. It's the stuff that's like long-term agronomic, you know, sustainability studies, environmental impacts, and plant breeding, frankly. I, plant breeding is one of those things where, um, you know, it's just super important, but it's not terribly sexy or interesting. It's not going to get like the big money over and over again. So, I, I mean, okay, so here's here's one example. Um, uh, apples, right? So you see uh, like red delicious apples that are not delicious. <laughs> They're, right? Have you ever had like a red delicious apple and go, well, that was underwhelming, right? <laughs> so it used to be like when that apple originally came about, um, you but it was delicious. It really was. But over time, so you, apple seeds, uh, if you planted a red delicious apple seed in the ground and grew the apple tree, you would not get a red delicious apple. They do not breed true. Their seeds are all over the place. You'll get a crab apple. You'll get a bunch of gross crab apples and, that are not good for eating. And so apple breeding is like really hard to do. How do you get new varieties? Um, like a... Uh, like a golden delicious was, I think, just a mutation, like a somatic mutation on a branch of a, a red delicious apple tree. And then one branch, like it just didn't have the red pigment and it was gold instead. I'm like, this is cool. So they just propagate it through that branch. And and so you, if you want to breed new varieties, it takes like a lot of money and a lot of patience to to find really good new apples. And I mean, right now there's this, you know, industry that's blossoming for like apple cider, like hard, hard apple cider and pear cider is called Perry. And it, you need, you need like real effort to go into making just the right, like breeding the right apples to get that kind of, that kind of uh, the apple that you're looking for. And if you don't, if you don't keep improving after a while, the apples, they're just not going to taste is good. They'll lose some of the properties that you want because you're not maintaining them. And so, you know, red delicious apples 50 years ago probably tasted a lot better and they don't anymore. And I mean, this is not just taste, obviously, like there are things that we use apples differently for nowadays, like, like cider. And there's also pests and pathogens and other things like the, um, antibiotic example I used earlier, you know, maybe we could breed a, a plant that did not need that was not susceptible to that disease in the first place didn't need to have those types of um bactericides put on them those antibiotics so you know but but there's just not a lot of money for that kind of long-term research that never really like you, you'll have products come out of them every couple of years you'll have like a new variety or something but it's it's kind of a status quo just trying to maintain the status quo and because we don't have very much funding, even in this kind of formula funds capacity grants back to the states, you're not even really even maintaining what we have. It's kind of a, a sad state where, I don't know if you noticed, but fruits and vegetables just get less and less tasty and less and less nutritious. And we're not doing that much about it. Yeah, I noticed uh, I, the tastiest fruits I get are from like local farmers that I know. Or like uh, from my, my grandmother's house because she has uh, like some lemon she'll send us. It's like this is not taste. This is not taste yeah. like from uh, from the store, um, which is interesting. How long? Yeah. Like if we if we were to do it right, like if you had like proper funding, how much time would it take, and what would it look like? Like if if if, if like yeah, if you had like proper funding, what would it look like differently than today? Oh my gosh, there's so many things that we could do that are like right on the horizon that it, it's. I, well, first of all, food would taste better. Um, I strongly believe <laughs> that food would taste a lot better. And, you know, there are all these problems that 
are just kind of we're dealing with right now that are creeping up on us that we could address. So, for example, um, have you heard of uh, citrus greening disease? Only because you linked it to me. I did not. I've oh. never heard of it before you said it. I was like, this is fascinating. I can't wait to ask you questions about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So there's this, uh, there's this disease that it's been attacking citrus in Florida and it has already destroyed half of the citrus industry in Florida. And people are racing to try to solve this problem through breeding, through anything anything, anything at all. <laughs> They've come up with some really neat ideas for how to deal with this, but it takes a long time. And we were not out ahead of this. And and the only reason we have this money is Congress specifically allocated certain funds just for this, because there's just not enough money in the normal pot for anything like this. Um, I don't know if you've seen any orange juice commercials lately. There aren't any, basically, because all of the commodity groups that come together to make those... Um, like Florida orange juice commercials, you know, the ones that are not like specific to a brand. It's not like Tropicana. It's just Florida orange juice. All that money, instead of going into advertising, is going into research on this. And we still don't have like an answer that is not going to take us at least 10 years to implement. So, you know, you're going to have deaths of industries without this kind of money. Um, and and who knows what kind of stuff we would have instead. Another thing that we're, you know, the ag industry is worried about is um, carbon, carbon sequestration and greenhouse gases. And right now, you know, people think about reducing emissions of cars and, you know, maybe not traveling as much by air, which is like never going to happen. But the soil can actually absorb a huge amount of carbon. And what about soil research? What about plants that have deep roots that can anchor the soil in place and keep it collecting carbon? What if U.S. agriculture could become a net sink for carbon instead of agriculture being a producer of carbon? I mean, that would be incredible. That would be a total game changer. And we're just not even throwing close to enough money at this problem. Yeah, we have good ideas that aren't being funded. I've always felt like the... Like the the carbon issue, I feel like like plants to some extent, like that's that's gonna be what really like is the game changer. Which I, like when I would, like when I do research into it, it's like I, I'm always surprised when people are like, oh, we built this like giant little like uh, filter thing that sits in sits in cities and and like sucks out the the bad. <laughs> that's called a tree. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I said that's called a tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the, the, I think um. In China, they literally built like a like a building that instead yeah. of just like planting trees, they're just like I'm gonna build a building. But they have they have some like really incredible uh, air pollution. And China is outspending us on ag research, by the way. I mean, they have in their lifetimes, in like the average population's lifetime, they've experienced a famine. There are a lot of countries in this world who have experienced a famine within you know uh, living memory, and they those countries they put more resources into ag research than other countries. It's just uh, like a truth. And what's silly is that the reason they had those famines is not something that, like it, 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 it could happen anywhere, you know, you, it, and it's just happened to be those countries that recognize how important this is. And I'm not saying the U.S. is going to is going to have a famine, but I am saying that look around the world, see where the wind is blowing. You know, and, and, and try to get out in front of that. And China's outspending us hugely. And they they buy most of our soybeans. They're, they are a huge reason that American farmers can stay in business. Um, and if they don't need to buy our soybeans anymore, then, you know, that's that's going to be a problem for our economy, too. Something that I've, I've, I find interesting in China, like they're working to stop I don't know, there's probably like a technical term for what they're working on, but it's like the Gobi Desert is like destroying mm -hmm. agricultural land, so they're planting a bunch of trees. Is there anything like that in America that we're working on that maybe is not as known? Like we have the citrus stuff that's going on. Are there other things that are like like a desert encroaching <laughs> and like taking away farmland that is like really big that people don't know about or people do know about? Are you familiar with the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico? No. All right. So the Mississippi River runs from north to south. It empties out into the Gulf of Mexico. And when farmers use um, 
certain nutrients to help their crops grow, sometimes they wash out into the river and it ends up in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it ends up in like the Great Lakes, you know, depending on what watershed you're in. And, you know, sometimes farmers are incredibly judicious in how much um, of these fertilizers they use. And sometimes they're not. And sometimes even if they're judicious about the amount, they can still end up washing away because, um, uh, because their soil is not good quality enough to hold it in. So you'll just get the soil itself eroding right into the water. And this has caused a number of problems. Um, I think it was the city of Toledo had to shut down their water supply because they could not deal with the pollution in the water. When you have a lot of nutrients, so this is what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, you have a lot of nutrients that go into a water and suddenly all the microorganisms like algae that eat those nutrients, they have like this all you can eat buffet and they go crazy and they produce a huge mat of, of living organism that basically blots out the sun underneath. And that's what creates this dead zone. Nothing, nothing can grow uh, because they've used up all the oxygen and they're blocking some, a bunch of sunlight and 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 so you have these dead zones. This is incredibly challenging for like the Gulf shrimp and fish industries because now you don't have anything living there. And this dead zone is growing and growing every year. It's It's the biggest it's ever been. And this is a problem with it starts with agriculture. It just, it starts there. It ends there. We, we have to figure out a way to not pollute <laughs> the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, when, when this first started to be a problem, you'd have farmers up in Iowa saying, are you kidding me? The Gulf of Mexico is literally thousands of miles away. How could anything that I'm doing here have an effect there? It was just not, it was not a, not a thing. Is the that it, 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 I'm probably wrong, but the term for when there's like chem, chemical runoff isn't that called eutrophication? That's not the runoff itself. That's what happens when um, yeah, eutrophication is when uh, is not the runoff itself, but that process of of a bunch of organisms suddenly getting a bunch of nutrients and then depleting the oxygen in the water. I'm so close. I was like, oh, well, you remembered it. All right, so um, part of the USDA. They do agriculture research there. When Gorbachev came to visit America, that was the first place they went. That was the most important thing. And again, if you have not experienced a famine yourself, you may not truly appreciate that food is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again for taking the time and, uh, Sorry for not being more mindful. Uh, you gave us a, a lot of lot to think about, and it's just just such a, a fascinating topic. I, I hope everyone really enjoys it. If anyone has any questions or anything like that, they can forward them to me, and then maybe they'll get to you. I don't know. Um, and then I'll get you the email about recommended resources and stuff like that. Is there anything else before you go that we should talk about or anything? Oh, that's it. I'm. Thank you so much. This was really fun. No, no. Thank you for you know, all the time. Like seriously. <laughs> I, I really appreciate it. I feel bad for not paying better attention to the time. I should have asked that in the beginning. Um, so my bad, but thank you very much. It's all good. We'll do this again sometime. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening today. Please subscribe, leave a review, check out our website, learningwithlowell.com, or join my mailing list. I'm here to learn and share what I learn. New episodes every Tuesday, new emails every Monday, and I blog on topics that I find fascinating.